standing ovation. Thank you, Lucy, Trey, Leia. Listen, I uh, I meant what I said this morning. Gun violence. Movement that wins without young people. This is your movement. You are seeing. Um, let me just take one quick point of personal privilege. Um, I get to engage in this fight every single day alongside uh, the best delegation in the country. You saw Senator Blumenthal up here earlier. But I am also joined here today um, by three. Three members of the House delegation, Representative Rosa Delore, Representative John Anna Hayes, and Representative John Larson. Give them a big round of applause. They are all fighters. I am the only thing standing between you and the President of the United States. So, so I am going to get right to the point. Um, and the point is this. The bipartisan today would not have happened without Joe Biden. When, when we say it's been 30 years since we beat the NRA, what we really mean is that it's been 30 years since Joe Biden beat the NRA. Right? Um, it, was, it was Senator Joe Biden and a handful of others who took on the NRA and the gun lobby in the 1980s and the 1990s and secured passage of those landmark pieces of legislation bill and the assault weapons bill. Joe Biden was fighting and beating the gun lobby before anybody else was. He knows how to do it. And last summer, after Uvalde, Joe Biden stepped up again. In the days after the shooting, we had begun early by the pundits. They just wrote us off, right? They'd seen it before. A mass shooting happens, followed by... some chatter of action, and then Democrats just retreating to their corners. The week after Uvalde was a recess week for Congress, so we were all going back to our states and to our districts. We were leaving town. Even more reason to think this momentum, whatever we had, was going to vanish. But then, then I got a call from the White House. They told, told me that the president was considering going on television, using one of his few precious primetime addresses to challenge Congress and the country to, to make this time different. He called me and we talked about how 
Some people were saying that this time wasn't going to be different. Some people were saying that a speech wasn't going to make any difference. But he told me, I care about this issue so deeply in my bones, the safety of our kids, that I'm willing to take any chance, no matter how remote, to get something done. If I give this speech, is it going to help? He asked. I told him he would. And you remember? Remember this address, this emotional, heartfelt plea to the nation at a moment when we could have lost all of that momentum. And along with his daily support of our month-long talks, Joe Biden is the big, biggest part of the story as to why the Bipartisan Safer Communities Act became law. Now, President Biden knows the feeling of loss, and maybe that's why he wears his feelings about this issue on his church sleeve. Maybe that's why he feels this connection to many people in this room who have lost loved ones to this epidemic. Maybe that's why he's joined us here today to help us talk about the progress we've made and the progress that we are going to make. But I will end by saying what I have said now two different times on this stage over the course of today. I believe that the next decade is our decade, is our movement's decade. A decade to consistently make changes to our our laws to make our communities and our kids safer from gun violence. And that opportunity exists because we have a president who eats, sleeps, and breathes the fight to end this epidemic. Our president, President Joe Biden. <laughs> I think maybe your patience exceeds your good judgment. <laughs> Please have a seat if you have one. Thank you for uh, thank you for your your commitment. I really mean it. You know, uh, as a kid, I came out of a different movement, the civil rights. Rights movement. Senator Blumenthal and I have talked about it before. I come from a state that is the largest black population in the country and was segregated when I was a kid. That's what got me engaged and made me believe that we could do anything. Maybe we could do anything. So I want to thank, uh, I want to thank Chris for the introduction. But before I say anything else, I want to acknowledge the amazing young people you just heard from. You know, I really mean it. It takes extraordinary courage. And then to stand up here and retell the story. 
as many of you out there, either parents, relatives, and or victims yourself, it's not just your story. It's the first graders, the educators of Sandy Hook. It's the kids and teachers at Uvalde I sat with with afterwards. It's the Emmanuel, the, uh, Mother Emmanuel, eight years ago, tomorrow. It's the Tree of Life Synagogue. It's, uh, it's the families all across us, Hartford. Not just the shootings that make the headlines, but every single day. Every damn day in America. In the air. In areas that are poor, mostly minority, there's a mass shooting. And it never reaches the crescendo that it reaches other places every single day. And folks, <laughs> folks, there's a there's a lot, a lot we have to do. And it takes courage to tell a story that you've been through because, you know, I spent a lot of time as president and I spent 30 sometimes visits and many more days in Afghanistan and in Iraq. And I watch, you know, we have post-traumatic stress, they call it, for soldiers. What's the difference between the post-traumatic stress that a soldier meets in the hills of Afghanistan? And a four year fourth grade kid meets in a in a classroom when they have to duck and cover. <laughs> no, I'm serious. And and you're here, many of you, and it brings it all back. It brings it all back for your families, your parents, your siblings. And it brings it back to the entire country. It ripples through the nation. I don't know how many times I met with people at events in the country who shake my hand and say, I'm worried. There's been another shooting not far from where I live. I'm scared to send my kid to school. It's had a profound impact. And some people in this room have turned your pain into purpose. I suspect all of you have. Your loss into determination and your anger, justifiable anger into a deep-seated commitment. You're the reason why I'm so optimistic about the future of this country, and that's not hyperbole. That's a fact. You're the best educated, most involved, least selfish, and most consequential generation in American history. I'm also optimistic because of leaders like Senator Murphy. Chris, thanks for inviting me today to organize and for organizing this summit. You know, we, Chris and I, Chris and I have known each other a long time. We grew closer after that December day in 2012. You just elected to the Senate, and Barack and I had just been re-elected re to the White House when the soul of Newtown, the soul of Connecticut, the soul of the nation was pierced forever. You've never forgotten that feeling. You've never given up on something that can never, we can never lose, ever lose. Hope, hope. Same goes for Senator Dick Blumenthal, a great friend. He was Attorney General of my deceased son. <laughs> was Attorney General of Delaware. Another leader in the fight against gun violence. And Governor Lamont, Connecticut delegation, which is incredible. I think on this issue and many others, you're the best delegation in the United States. States of America. No, I, that, that, that's the truth. I also want to acknowledge the gentle lady from Georgia, Lucy Macbeth. Lucy carries her son Jordan in her heart. She, she proves. You can run for office and in gun violence in the South, and you can win. And only by about 20 points or something like that. I've never come close. 
Lucy, I know this isn't easy for you. you. You're a real pro, but I know it's not easy for you. I remember. And one of Jill's favorite people in the whole world, and mine, I always introduce her as she is, Mark Kelly is her husband. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, Gabby Gifford. She's a... Gabby has more courage than most people I have ever known. I had the honor to bestow the Presidential Medal of Freedom, Gabby, not only for her courage, but her intellect that helped carry this movement. She's not stopping now. She's not stopping now. Gabby, I love you. You're wonderful. And Congressman Larson, thanks for the passport into your district. You've never given up. You've never given up either. And to the state and local leaders, the mayor, others, the dedication to this vital issue is critical. It really, really is. Look, you know, to the survivors and families, Jill and I, and Jill and my wife, Jill, is not here today with me. She is in Delaware right now. She had to go back up. Jill and I have gotten to know many of you over the years. Some of us have become friends for a long time. We've kept in touch. Mark, it's good to see you again and your family. And losses may be di different circumstances, but uh, we've shared before something that's helped our family. When my wife and daughter were killed, and a tractor trailer struck them and just after I got elected, my two boys weren't expected to live. And then later when my son, Bo, who was the attorney general and, a, and a spent a year, volunteered to spend a year in Iraq, died stage four glioblastoma. My daughter, Ashley, tapped, taped a mirror, uh, excuse me, a message in the mirror. The way we get to, everything gets to me through my wife and daughter now is of, they know I have to shave in the morning. <laughs> so they'll tape on the mirror for real. So I could see when I was shaving. One day she left me a quote from Immanuel Kant, who wrote that finding happiness and peace of mind when it seems impossible can be done. He said, you need something to do, someone to love, and something to hope for was to fulfill the promise I made to my son Bone, my family, and your families, and you've made too, that I would not retreat from public life and the sadness that I felt afterwards, that I'd stay engaged to solve problems. Someone to love, my family, my kids, my grandkids, kids, and something to hope for. All of you survivors and advocates have built real movement with something to hope for, something to hope for, that your collective trauma and injuries are not going to be in vain, that your friend, your family member, your loved one did not die in vain, that by acting in their memory, you can prevent the next tragedy. You can save life. You can save families. In the process, you can continue to save the country. And I mean that. Look, folks, a year ago, the conventional wisdom was we would never get any Republicans to support gun legislation, period. That was the conventional wisdom. And all the usual obstacles would block us once again. But it didn't happen. Instead, I signed the law of the Bipartisan Savers Community Act, which you've referenced several times today, which many have described, which many have described as the most significant gun safety law in 30 years. And it is. But for me, and for most of you, here's what it really is. It's an important first step.
I know it feels like it isn't enough when you turn on the news and see another tragedy in a school, a grocery store, or a parade, or a place in America. Honestly, I feel like that as well. The facts give us reason to hope, though. So far this year, there are murders down in many major cities across the country. There's far too much gun violence, but that's why the summit is so important and why Chris asked me to be here today with the following message. One year ago, we did come together. We did hear the call for too many families. Every one of those families, I met at all the places I mentioned. I was there for, met with every, every single family. <clears throat> you know what they'd say? Almost the same phrase, Dick. They'd say, do something. Do something. And the response usually was, my prayers are with you. Well, your prayers are fine. They're important. It doesn't happen again, but it's not going to stop it. You have to take action. You have to move. You have to do something. And so what happened? We began to continue to fight again. Because for a while there, there were only about two dozen of us in the Congress or as vice president or when I was as, as president. The most meaningful gun safety law in 30 years. We did overcome an unrelenting opposition of the gun lobby to gun manufacturers and so many politicians who hide behind the belief that they'll never have to pay a price for their inaction when they oppose common sense gun legislation. And we beat them. We beat them. And we did it through a bipartisan effort that included a majority of responsible gun owners. Because whether you're Democrats or Republicans, we all want families to be safe. We all want to drop them off at the house of worship, a mall, a movie, a school door, without worrying. That's the last time we're ever going to see them. We all want our kids to have the freedom to learn, to read, and to write, instead of learning how to duck and cover in a classroom. And above all, we all agree, we are not finished. We are not finished. We are not finished. Look, I know you've had a full day of some of getting into details of the law, but folks, listen at home. Here's a quick summary of what this law is doing. It's already allowing the Justice Department through the FBI to run enhanced background checks on young people under 21 trying to buy a firearm. This legislation has already provided more than $230 million for states to expand the use of tools like the red flag laws, as my son was the first to enforce when he was attorney general, which says that a court has the right to temporarily remove, temporarily remove a firearm where there's danger to themselves or others. More people die from gun violence as a consequence of suicide than anything else that happens in the nation. Suicide. This legislation has already delivered more than $1.5 billion to states and communities to make schools safe improve access to mental health services and help young people deal with the grief and trauma resulting from gun violence, post-traumatic stress syndrome. It includes an additional 14,000 mental health professionals hired and trained to work in our schools. The law helps prevent domestic abuse from purchasing guns. I'm the guy that wrote the Violence Against Women Act. I proposed a long time ago. I didn't, I didn't say for that reason, but I care deeply about it because the ultimate abuse, the abuse of power. My dad used to say the single worst abuse of all was the abuse of power. We fought like, like hell to close the so-called boyfriend loophole 
if in fact you had a stayaway order issued against a man or a woman because of your boyfriend or girlfriend and they weren't your spouse, then guess what? They decided the last minute they decided not to impose this limitation on being able to own a weapon. So we finally can say that those convicted of domestic violence abuse against their girlfriend or boyfriend cannot buy a firearm, period. <clears throat> and by the way, it's already saving lives. There are fewer deaths occurring in that area. For the first time ever, we explicitly made gun traffic a federal crime. I said, what the hell, it wasn't already? No, I'm serious. Think about it. You go home and tell your mother, father, brother, sister, aunt, uncle that, well, gun trapping is now a crime. They're going to look at it like, what are you talking It's always been a crime. It wasn't a crime. We did the same thing for straw purchases. That's when a middleman who can pass the background check buys a gun, usually for someone who can't pass the background check. It's now a federal crime if you do that. Finally, we finally clarified who needs to register as a federal licensed gun dealer. Because a federally licensed gun dealer is required by law to run background checks on those he's selling a weapon to. And in most cities down in Philadelphia and New York, areas I know well, like up here, you'd see a truck pull up, pull to the curb, and selling weapons. Selling guns, selling AR-15, selling weapons. Well, guess what? You do that now, you go to jail. There's so much more, but the bottom line, if this law had been in place a year ago, lives would have been saved. And it's in place now. And it is saving lives today. We got it done because of you, not a joke. You all think we're being nice to you. It's, you're tough. Thank God. God. But, I, but, I, but I really mean it. It's because of you. Moms demand action. Big, big deal. All of, it, all, of it, all of it. No, I, I really mean it. Because what did you? you do and young people coming out you, people who you who, who you grew up with who didn't think this was real the suburbanite republican man or woman or democrat not just republican in the south thinks well you know everything's fine all of a sudden they see someone of your caliber someone of your commitment Walking down the street saying we got to do something. It matters. It matters. It matters. It matters. And you can feel it. You can taste it, what you're doing. And here's the deal. You're changing the culture. Proving we can do more than just thoughts and prayers. You're changing our politics. You're registering voters. You're re recruiting candidates. You're getting them elected. You've proven that you're powerful and you're relentless. And it matters. It matters. They know you're not going away. As I just said when I signed the law, a call to action to do more, because I don't see that this was enough. Neither do you. Really important. Really, if nothing else happened, we've changed things for the better. So I set out to take as much executive action as a fancy word of saying, what can I do as president on my own? Executive action that made it illegal to manufacture so-called ghost guns. I just signed that. I said that. It's being challenged in court, but so far, matters that allow anyone to assemble a gun at home 
bought from several different places in as little as 30 minutes. Come on. These weapons don't have serial numbers. That's why they like to buy them. So criminals can use them, commit crimes, and not leave behind a registration of who owned the weapon. Made it harder for people to buy stabilized braces. Put a pistol on a brace, it may, turns into a gun. Makes it more, you can have a higher caliber weapon, a higher caliber bullet coming out of that gun. To essentially turn it into a short barrel rifle, which has been a weapon of choice by a number of mass shooters. Making it easier to buy gun locks and other safe storage at gun stores. If any one of you drove up the parking lot here today, got out of your car and left a key in your car, and a kid comes along as 13, 14 years old, gets in your car, takes in a joyride and kills someone, guess what? You're liable. Why should that not be the case? You don't lock up your weapon. Why should that not be the case? Why is that not required? And most gun owners agree with me. We also established a zero tolerance policy for rogue gun dealers who willfully violate the law. Now, instead of a slap on the wrist, their license is revoked. You have a lot of gun dealers who are engaged in shady actions. Well, guess what? It used to be they get, they get a fine. Now they lose their license to sell. We established a strike force to crack down on gun trafficking across state lines, including guns brought up from Georgia, South Carolina, Washington, Philadelphia, New York, right here to Hartford. All told, we've taken more executive action to reduce gun violence than any of my predecessors, probably than all my predecessors. They're being challenged in the corporate. So far, so good. And the budget I submitted to Congress would help reduce crime by increasing funding, go after gun traffickers. And for though, by the way, you know what I get when I we're talking about the fentanyl, the border and all that? I speak with the president of Mexico. Will you stop sending guns to us? We are sending dangerous weapons, particularly assault weapons, to Mexico. To Mexico. They're asking us, please stop it. Cut it off at the border. What in God's name are we becoming if we don't do this? Look, ladies and gentlemen, for those who say they're concerned about crime, you can't deal with crime without dealing with gun violence. It's a simple proposition. Remember, for a long time in America, car accidents were the leading killing of children. This was mentioned earlier. Then in 2020, guns became the number one killer of children in America. Guns. More than car accidents, more than cancer. Let me say that again. We can't let that just become another statistic. Guns, the number one killer of children in the United States of America? Folks, it's time once again that we banned AR-15 rifles. Oh, <laughs> High capacity magazines they're not only a weapon of war they're the single biggest driver of profits for the gun industry that's why they're selling them profit 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 the single biggest as I said we did it once before in 94 and 10 years after that the ban was mass shooting was down significantly the number of mass shootings. That is when the ban expired, mass shootings tripled. 
But let the ban on assault weapons, high capacity magazines come back into vogue. Look, I find it outrageous that of all the industries in America, by the way, I've been doing this a long, long time. I, I know I don't look that old, I know. <laughs> I'm a little under 103. <laughs> but all kidding aside, I thought, I mean, I'm going to say something outrageous. I was a pretty powerful senator. I pretty, pretty not managed some of the biggest committees, judiciary, foreign policy, et cetera. But I didn't know 10 years ago. I didn't know that their gun manufacturers immune from liability. I didn't know that. Gun manufacturers. Just imagine how many more people would be dead if the tobacco industry, if the tobacco industry so it's immune from liability. You couldn't sue the tobacco industry. I'm, I'm, just, I'm being deadly earnest. Think about the number of people who would be dead today that are alive because we could sue them, and they paid billions of dollars for, their, for, for, for the damage they were doing. Well, ladies, we need to end immunity for gun manufacturers. Got to hold them accountable. And it's time we establish universal background checks that require safe storage for firearms. And just remember, the United States of America has the finest fighting force in the history of the world. We provide our, these same service members with the most lethal weapons on earth. But we also require them to receive significant training before they're allowed to use them. We require extensive background checks and mental health assessment on them before they can allow to use them. We require them to lock them up and store the weapons responsibly or their court martial and put in jug. These are common sense requirements. All gun owners should follow. Every gun owner should be required to have the same requirements held to him or her. We know what to do. Congress needs to act. Let me be clear about something. If this Congress refuses to act, we need a new Congress. And we need states to act as well. Not every, not every state has a governor as competent as Governor Lamont, and I mean that. But they can do a lot more. Look what the governor has done here in this state. Less than two weeks ago here in Connecticut, Governor Lamont signed a bipartisan legislation with more than a dozen measures to improve gun safety, from providing open carry and strengthening, from prohibiting open carry and strengthening the ban on assault weapons and ghost guns. Illinois, Washington State passed assault weapons bans this year bringing the total to 10 states in the District of Columbia. Michigan, Minnesota, Colorado, Vermont passed those establishing or strengthening the red flag laws. Now, 21 states plus the District of Columbia have red flag laws in effect. Since 2021, seven states have passed an increase in accountability for, gun, for the gun industry. I said, beginning, at, at the beginning, you, they've turned their pain pain and the purpose. You turned your cause into reality. I believe we reached a tipping point in this nation. I really do, swear to God. People in this room are the big reason why we reached that tipping point. As Senator Murphy says, success begets success. But the converse is also true. Failure begets failure. That's why Jill and I, Kamala, and the entire administration are more determined than ever that you should be successful as well. Look, let me close with this. I know many people here who have been impacted by gun violence, lost someone they love, fought so hard for so many years. A lot of you are tired. You're tired. No, I, I get it. Try being 110 and doing it again. <laughs>
All kidding aside, a lot of people are frustrated. My mother, God love her, all five foot one, Catherine Gina Finney, she looked at me and said, Joey, never bow, never bend, never yield, never kneel. We never will on this issue. Never, 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 never. We have a rational policy. Folks, are we ever going to make progress we need to make? I'm here to tell you we cannot give up. We will not get there. I still remember the people I met with in Newtown, in Orlando, in Las Vegas, in Pittsburgh, in Charleston, Parkland, El Paso. So, the Uvalde, Buffalo, Monterey Park, and so many other places that never make the headlines. I've never forgotten them. And I never will forget them. And I'll never stop fighting for them, I promise you. And I believe this is true, that everyone in this room, you'll never stop fighting for them as well. We will ban assault weapons in this country. We will ban multi-round magazines. We will hold gun makers liable. We will beat the gun industry. We will beat big money that sits behind them. And the politicians refuse to stand up and act. It won't be easy. I have no illusions how fiercely they'll fight back. But I also have no illusions about the people in this room. Look at what you've already done here in Connecticut and around the country. Look at the movement you've built. Look at the people you've helped elect. Look at the progress you've made in state houses. Look at all the mothers organizing all across the country. Listen to the young people who've spoken out here today. They're speaking for a whole generation and they will not be ignored. They will not be shunned. They will not be silent. In this moment, this moment, we have to remember what I got to know him. Nelson Mandela, when I tried to get to Africa, to South Africa to meet him. And he came back and he met me when he was finally freed. He met me at the White House. And he looked at me, and I swear to God, it wasn't unique to me, I'm sure. He said, it always seems impossible until it gets done. There's nothing beyond our capacity. That's the power of memory of your loved one. That's the power of this movement. That's the power of America. Our lives and the lives of our nation find purpose. Something to do, someone to love, something to hope for. We have just to keep going and keep the faith. Every time I walk out of my grandpa Finnegan's house, I'm just to yell, Joey, keep the faith. My grandmother would yell, no, Joey, spread it. <laughs> Remember who we are. We're the United States of America. And there's nothing beyond our capacity when we do it together. God bless you all and may God protect our troops. We can get this done. Thank you, thank you, thank you. I mean it. Thank you. Now, as you, some of you know, I'd usually come down and say hi to all of you. They tell me there's a storm coming in. Is that right? Is, still, is that still the deal? That's the truth. Now, don't make a lie. As that, as that scene in the John Wayne movie, don't make me a dog-faced lion pony soldier. All right, well, I tell you what. Um, here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to ask the White House photographer to come up. And all I'm going to do is I'm going to stand. I can't. I usually shake everybody's hand. But I'm going to stand in front of each section. No, I really mean it. And then, and if you can see the camera, they can see you. And uh, it's the least consequential part of this whole meeting for you. I promise. All right. God save the queen, man.